You know, I have said a number of times that no task, no accomplishment, and no program of the American Legion outweighs the importance of saving a veteran's life. This is why we put so much emphasis on our Be The One mission. And we are fortunate to have a couple of experts with us here today in our efforts to prevent these tragedies. And that's what it is. For those that are listening, or may be listening, maybe that veterans are not a part of our family yet, be a part of us. You are important. Your life matters. And so we have Dr. Keita Franklin, and she has served as a principal advisor for both DOD and VA in all matters related to suicide prevention. A national leader on the issue, Dr. Franklin has more than 20 years of experience leading enterprise-wide programs for veterans and their families. And we also have with us is Wendy Laxo, a proven leader who achieved extraordinary results in her capacity with the Army Suicide Prevention Program, the DOD's partnerships and communications efforts, and as Deputy Director for VA's Suicide Prevention Office. I want you to put your hands together and give these two wonderful servant leaders a warm round of applause as they come on, come before us and give us the resources so that we too can change lives and save lives. Ladies. Thank you, Commander. Is that all right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. So on behalf, behalf of um, Dr. Kelly Posner, who is the director of the Columbia Lighthouse Project, also the lead investigator and creator of the Columbia Protocol, which you have in your hand, we are thrilled to be able to partner with the American Legion and be part of the Be The One Foundation and the solution to end veteran suicide. So I am super, super thrilled to be here. I'm Wendy Laxo. I um, am a, well, I've been affiliated with the Army family for 37 years. My husband was 30 years, oop, did I hear anybody from the Army out there? <laughs> oh, nice, okay. So my husband was 30 years in the Army. Our older son served for just over six, and our youngest is in cur currently in South Korea serving today. Um, so an Army family. True, you breed your own, absolutely. I want to say today's conversation could be uncomfortable for some of you, um, and that's okay. That's okay. If you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling maybe a little anxious, upset, if this may hit home to you a little bit, you can either take a breather and just relax at your chair or step out. It's okay to step out. But I encourage you, you guys do buddy checks, I encourage you to take a buddy with you, okay? And just take your time compose yourself again, and come back again if, you, if you're able to. But I just wanted to uh, say that. Kita? Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon, American Legion. We are thrilled to be with everybody today. And like Wendy, I also come from a military family. I've been pleased to serve as a government servant in um, suicide prevention, but I also, my father was enlisted in the Navy, and so I grew up on Navy bases around the nation. <laughs> and also married into an Air Force family as well. So been associated with the military my entire life, literally, um, and could not be more pleased to be sharing this critical content and so proud of the American Legion for taking on the fight to end veteran suicide and for taking you from a place, as the commander said, from awareness to action, and that's what this talk is about today, this training. So we'll just go ahead and jump right in. I want to make sure you know that today what we plan to give you is the tools. The tools that were placed on your chair, the tools, the script, what to do, what to say, when to say it, and how to get after it. So that's what this is about today. And as we get started, I should probably set the stage so that you know what's in front of us when we think about veteran suicide. And, and I have here on the slide, and you can look at it a little bit about the data, but I want you to know that we have in our nation over 40,000 people end their life every day by suicide. 
And that uh, number represents all walks of life, and I'll tell you more about that. But while we're here today together at the American Legion, today on this date, 123 people across the US will have ended their life by suicide. So at least you don't recognize what a serious problem this is. These numbers tell the story. And we know within that 123, unfortunately and tragically for our nation, 17 of those are veterans. And if we include the active duty component, we're now up to 20, 20 of the 123 a day. And that number represents just those that end their life by suicide. It does not represent the numbers that attempt suicide or the numbers of people across our nation that are having thoughts of suicide, what we in the clinical field call ideations, they're thinking of suicide, which is also an indicator that we'll talk more about today. So suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people across our nation, particularly for veterans under the age of 45, and there are a number of other high-risk categories that we'll talk about. But I want you to know how serious the problem is, and obviously the American Legion would not be as invested as it is um, with Be The One campaign. I agree that this is the, the differentiator coming to the field, having worked in the field for many years. This is a big differentiator, being able to get in front of all of you today and give you the tools to walk away to save a life today this afternoon, this evening. So above and beyond the data, you should also just know a little bit, like a 101 graduate level course on who's at risk. How do we know who's at risk? When you look at someone, can you tell? The answer is no. So when you're trying to better understand the risk factors, it is a multitude of risks. There's likely 20 to 25 things that could be going on with any single person in this room today and anybody across the nation. And those risks are here. Some of them we can do something about. Some of them individuals come to us with histories that are difficult to manage, but good to know. If somebody is uh, presenting where they've had you know, trauma in their history, where they have mental health in their history or substance abuse in their history. These are things that are good to know. But within our veteran population and our active duty population, not every service member or veteran that ends their life by suicide has a mental health problem. And I think that's what's um, been a, a surprising data point for the field and why we're, it's so important that we're here today. For years, we tried to prevent suicide in the hospital settings. So for years, we in the field, we waited until people came to us in the clinic setting and, and then we tried our best to save their lives, but many never made it to the clinical setting, which is why we're now trying to take the content on the road and equip Legionnaires across the nation and many others with the tools to get after suicide. Other risk factors include relationship problems. If you're interacting with a veteran that has an on-again, off-again boyfriend, girlfriend, marriage, divorce with another, parental issues, mom, dad, brother, sister, relationship problems across the board that are fragmented, that is a high risk. If we have a veteran that is struggling with feeling like they belong, that is another high risk situation. Veterans that are isolated and lonely, these are your risks. And you in your mind, when you're thinking about the risks, and I'm rattling them off rather quickly, you're cranking up your risk dial on every risk you know. And you're thinking through, how much is going on with this veteran in front of me? How many stressors do they have? Are they recently unemployed? Did they recently get in trouble with the law? Do they feel a sense of falling from glory now because they've maybe had a DUI and they're, they're also leaving the military that same month and they're transitioning out? That is a high risk time. So it's really the multitude of all of these risk factors that create this swirling effect that really become a overwhelming situation for veterans where they start to feel a sense of burdensomeness on their family, on their unit, on their community and we're trying to relieve that feeling and let them know that there's hope and that there's help right here in the American Legion and across their community, across the nation, there are resources available. So it's good for you to know today what these risks are so that you can begin to get to know one another at an even deeper level than you already do and understand what you can do to grow some protective factors because really it gets to the point where the risk factors become so high 
and there's often a moment of impulsivity that I think my colleague will talk more about that becomes difficult to handle. And what we're trying to do is grow what we in the field call protective factors. You know, I led behavioral health for the Marine Corps for a good number of years, six years during the heat of the war effort. And the Marines call it mitigating factors. Like what do we do to mitigate all these risks? Do we make sure people feel a sense of belongingness? Do we show them empathy and compassion and kindness? Do we get them to mental health care when they need it immediately? Do they know about the 988 crisis line so that they know they can make a call 24 seven? Like what resources can we bring to the fight in such a way that they feel protected from all these risks? And that number one resource is likely you. It's like, sign me up, I wanna be the one. Like it is all of us in this room today. So what we're trying to do is build protective factors to balance out the risk factors in a way that people realize that they have a life worth living and that there are reasons for them to be here today and they are one of our own. They are important members of our group and our society and, and we want and need them. So that's just a little quick 101 on numbers, prevalence rates, data. For those of you Legionnaires that like data in the room, how do you know who's at risk? It's not mental health alone, it's a host of other life things. And I wanna transfer it over to my colleague, Ms. Laxo, so she can share some more about our approach. So our approach is a community health approach. Who's heard of that before? Or a public health approach? Okay, great, I see a couple of hands. It is hard to see, these lights are quite bright, I will say, but I can see a couple of hands in the audience. But I will say it's about getting into our communities, right? Teaching others um, the signs, the facts, things that people are seeing, the risk factors of suicide, and what to do, right? So we're here to teach you those tools so you can go back to your communities and you can use your tool on somebody else who may need help. There's nothing greater than helping somebody else, right? Can everybody agree to that? There's nothing greater than helping somebody else. I truly believe that. So if we can take these really valuable tools back to our communities and integrate it, that's what we're here to do. Um, this community health approach, we, we hear so often that veterans don't seek help for so many reasons, right? Fear of, um, of being seen as broken. Um, there's a huge stigma out there and we know that. So that's why we're looking at um, everybody here, the Legion, you know, all your Legion members. We're looking at all of our communities, other VSOs as part of the Face the Fight Coalition, which we're part of, um, and really trying to understand suicide, the risk factors and get them in and what to do. I mean, with that. So, what we've said for many years, Keita and I worked together for a long, long time, and what we said for many years is we want to find our veterans where they work, live, and thrive. And where is that in our communities? But it's also on our public transportation, it's in our parks and recreation, it's in our gyms, right? It's everywhere that we go, it's at our um, services, our church services, if, if you attend. It's, everywhere where you work, live, and thrive. And it's so, so important to know that because like I'll talk about in a minute, like Kita said, you can't physically see somebody who may be experiencing some issues in their life and may be thinking about suicide. So getting to know individuals where they work, live, and thrive is one of our mottos. So I'm gonna go through some misconceptions and facts. And the reason why I do this is because it's a barrier Misconceptions are a barrier for individuals seeking help, but it's also a barrier for us reaching out to help others. So you'll see some of these misconceptions and I'm hoping that you'll, it'll change your attitude and your thoughts about some of these things as well. One of these, I love this one because I hear all the time, oh my gosh, you know what, I'm, I'm a clinician, I can't do anything. Well, guess what? I've been working in suicide prevention for 15, 20 years, too long to count. Um, and I am not a clinician. I've never been a clinician. I have a public health background um, and I'm a community member like all of you. So I'm not a clinician, but I've been doing suicide prevention for a very, very long time. And this does not need to be something that only clinicians can take care of. 
I know Keita also talked about the fact that it used to be, you know, we used to talk about suicide prevention and used to look for people um, in a hospital setting, right? Well, that no longer exists because we now know you don't have to be a clinician to help others. So owning a firearm is not associated with suicide risk. Um, and the reason we bring this up, and I'll just be very honest, nothing about Second Amendment rights at all. We have firearms in our home, safely stored in a lockbox. But we have firearms in our home, and I love to shoot. Um, this has everything to do with the fact that firearms are the number one means of suicide in the United States. I was just in the UK. And what did I talk to them about? Can anybody throw out a reason, uh, uh, something that I talked to them about that wasn't firearms? Bridges. I talked to them about bridges and what they can do to keep people safe with their, with their bridges. And I did that because that's their most least lethal means of suicide within the UK, is people jumping off of bridges. In Indonesia, it's pesticides. So if I was in Indonesia right now talking, I'd be talking about pesticides. But here I'm talking about firearms. So we know that it's su super, super important for us to make sure that our firearms are locked and stored, OK, with the ammunition in a, in a different area. Um, we talk about time and space. And what we mean by that is that, and there is data to prove this, is that if we're able to give or, or separate ourselves from our firearm when we are having issues or mental health issues or feeling vulnerable, then that gives us enough time, time and distance or time and space to be able to think about that and it does stop people from taking their lives. So whether that's giving it to your buddy, right, and, but getting it back, but giving it to them for a short period of time where you're experiencing things, or just keeping it locked and farther away or giving it to your friend or your spouse or whatever it may be, whatever works for you, that's a good thing. And we want to make sure that we're teaching individuals how to do that. So if you're removing access to one lethal means, someone's going to go on and use something else. So if I take away, um, my means, my medication that I was storing up um, to maybe, because I was thinking about suicide. If somebody takes them from me, I'm going to go ahead and grab something else and I'm going to do it another way. That is not true. So we've seen in many, many countries that UK being one, I'll just use it as an example. A long time ago, people used to kill themselves by putting their head in their oven. Um, they had coal gas at that time, and that was a lethal means. They took away that gas. I believe it's natural now. Don't quote me on that. But I'll leave it to natural now. And that isn't as lethal. So people, the suicide rates plummeted. And they have not come back up. So think about that. Um, if you take away a means, people aren't, gonna, aren't, more, aren't apt to go ahead and use another method. Suicide is impulsive. Most up here, when you look at this data, 25 to 40 percent of people think about it and end their life within five minutes. Five minutes. I can't, I mean, that is such a quick period of time. And that's why when we talk about integrating suicide prevention activities, we talk about it because people aren't suicidal. It's not a straight line, they're not always suicidal all the time, right? Like our emotions, our emotions ebb and flow. So same thing, people are suicidal, people are thinking about suicide and it comes and goes, right? It's not a straight line. So, um, but we have to realize that it's a very, very impulsive act and we have to constantly make sure that we're vigilant. You have anything to add to that, Kita? Okay, just making sure. Jump in if you need to. Um, so talking about, um, uh, suicide is going to lead or encourage somebody to, to die by suicide. So I'm going to tell you something. Um, I don't know how many of you attended the Be The One symposium. I wish all of you did. It was phenomenal. Um, Waco Hoover put together a very, very good lineup of thought leaders and 
individuals, veterans were there, I mean, who really talked about their situation and lived with lived experience. It was, it was great. But a colleague and friend of ours was also there. His name is Kevin Hines. Has anybody heard of Kevin Hines in the, in the audience? I'm trying to see if I can see any hands. I don't see many hands, if any. Kevin Hines is one of just a handful of individuals that jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and lived. And have, how many of you have been to the Golden Gate Bridge? Okay, I see a lot of hands now. So think of this story, because I'm gonna tell a little bit of a story, um, because I can't fathom this. So Kevin tells the story about how he's standing on the bridge. You know, he is profusely crying. I mean, tears are streaming down his face. So if you can picture it, these tears are streaming down his face and he's crying and he's standing on the bridge and he's like, you know, he's not, he's not wanting to jump and he's, his mind's playing tricks on him and he, he, he doesn't know what to do, but he's, so, he's struggling so much. This lady comes up to him with a group of friends because there's a lot of tourists and visitors that walk across that bridge. And she comes up and she walks over to him and he's like, you know what? She's gonna ask me if I'm okay. I, I, I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna be good. She's gonna help me. She pulls out her camera and says, can you take a picture? Again, tears are streaming down his face. He turns around. He's like, sure. Snaps a picture gives her the camera back, she doesn't say a thing, off they walk, not 30 seconds later he jumped off the bridge. So I guess the moral of that story is that we have to make sure that we're talking to people, that we approach people, that it's okay to talk about suicide. Because he talks about the fact that if he, if she would have said something, he would not have jumped. Okay, um, Kita touched on this a little bit. And you know, we have a colleague uh, who talks about his story too. When he was coming up, he's a social worker, when he was coming up in the, learning how to be a, a good social, work, social worker, they taught him that you could physically see people who were suicidal. That people who were depressed or they were crying or they had, you know, some issues or acting out or, you know, you could physically see it. We would have missed, and he regrets that, because he missed more than 50% of the individuals that could really be at risk, right? So he was missing so many people out there that are struggling. So over 50% of individuals who die by suicide do not have a mental health illness, do not have a mental health illness. But it's a lot of these other factors that Keita had talked about that are so important to pick up on, right? Okay, I'm turning it over to you. Yes, and one of the things that Wendy was reminding me of as we were talking about Kevin's story is just for you all to think about ambivalence. What we see is going on, and what was going on for Kevin that moment is moments of ambivalence where they want to die and then they don't want to die, and they're doing a dance in their head want to die, don't want to die, and this is the importance of us being able to enter the equation and help them. And a small act of kindness and being the one can be what it takes to at least get them off the bridge. I'm not saying that you're deputized as a therapist or you now have to do all this outrageous sort of things. No, you're just getting them an inch or two back off the bridge until we can get them more help. And we saw this play out also uh, on the national stage. Um, Kate Spade died by suicide. Anthony Bourdain died by suicide. Um, we have worked for the department when two-star generals have died by suicide. So this is absolutely, this ambivalence is our time to, to get in and help, and it is a problem of humanity. And so when we look at the data and you look at people that engage in firefighting and law enforcement and a host of other sort of first responder things, more people end their lives by suicide than, than on the job doing these things. So it is a, a global problem, not just a problem with veterans, and it just it does not discriminate across the board. We in the field um, emphasize certain subpopulations that we know are at increased risk, but I don't want your takeaway to be, okay, so we only have to worry about those subpopulations, because as soon as you turn your eye from the others, 
you, you will be surprised and we will get a fatality report of a veteran that doesn't fit in those subpopulation groups or, or an American. So how many of you are living or your states represent rural areas? Rural areas? Okay. Oh yeah, there's quite a few. Quite a few. This is a high risk area. For all the reasons that you all probably know better than me, I, you know, I'm living in Northern Virginia now, but um, certainly my extended families from Massachusetts and Maine, and, and there are rural areas back home that don't have instant access to transportation and metro and resources, like getting a mental health appointment when you need it within a day, within the same day as the crisis, those sort of things are super difficult to manage. So just know rural is a high risk. Key demographics, we'll see um, young children that are African American, those rates are rising. Pre-teen rates, so just you see here it on the slide, your takeaway is it can impact anybody. And it touches more than just those that die by suicide. I wanna explain this term we call in the field, and sometimes the field has complicated terms for no good reason, but we call it postvention, and I just wanna break it down a little bit. I talked at the beginning of the talk about the fact that 123 people die every day by suicide. When one person dies, we know that 135 people have been exposed. And that number comes from people who study people's social networks. So in the day I came into the field in 1994, I started my federal career with service members in July of 01, right before 9-11 hit. And at that time, years back, there was, it was seven people that were impacted. And they use the word impacted, we also say affected, but now it's thought about as you've been exposed. Like imagine you've been exposed to cigarette smoke or a chemical, it doesn't leave you. You know, I know any of you in the room that have, if you're willing to share, responded to someone who's been at risk of suicide? Some shows of hands. It doesn't leave you. You remember that, don't you? You remember the person. You remember the case. You remember what they said, what was going on for them. It doesn't leave. You've been exposed. Well, now I want you to know, when you've been exposed, you're also at risk. And this number amplifies within veteran communities because they consider themselves families. You all are a family. The, the 182nd, that's a family. You know, the, the, the Navy submarines that my father was on, that's a family. He wears those hats, you know, the USS Bremerton, the USS George Washington. That was a family. So when one of their own ends their life by suicide, 135 are now impacted and at risk because they can see themselves through the eyes of their fellow veteran and they may begin to think, well, that person has the same set of problems that I have. Maybe that's an okay way for me to solve mine as well. So this is how the numbers start to have a ripple effect in the field. So when I, we would get asked this question in Congress, like why are the numbers so high when we would testify? Well, the numbers are high because these veterans have been exposed to a lot of trauma. And when one, uh, when 17 die a day, if you take that figure, 123 a day across the nation, we now have 16,000 more people every day while we're trying to fight the fight at additional risk because they've been exposed. It doesn't mean that they will immediately go end their life, but if they have been exposed and have all those risks I've talked about and have depleted their protective factors, that's the trifecta or the equation that becomes difficult. So I want to make sure we emphasize just how important a common language is when we're assessing for suicide. We're gonna teach you more about the tool now, the what you can do about it. And it's important because when you talk to one another and you talk to referral agencies, the Columbia is a tool that is used globally across the nation and internationally. But when you, how many of you have heard of the Columbia Protocol? The Columbia hey. Protocol, it's on your seat. Oh, okay, excellent, this will make it good. So when you call a hospital or you're making a referral to a therapist or an employment agency or you're, you're, you have permission to share and, and you say someone is at moderate risk or high risk, it will be a common set of language because people are very familiar with, with, with this one single tool. And you have it on your chairs above you, so I'm gonna ask you to pull it out. And I, and I just want to make sure that I go through it a little bit here with you. 
And so the first question is that I, and I want to break down the science behind it so that you understand the why behind each question. It's a set of questions and you have to truly stick to the protocol because it was built with a level of what they call in the field, fidelity to the model. So it's not something you can like kind of dance around with. And even I who've been in the field for years, I still read it from my card and I make sure that I'm doing it correctly. So the first question is, have you wished you were dead or wished that you, would, that you wanna go to sleep and not wake up? This is critically important because we're trying to get at their ideations. Are they having thoughts? And you're gonna ask these two questions up front and depending on how they answer, you may not ask any more, okay? So just two up front. And if they say, no, I'm not having thoughts, you're okay, and you just say, well, I was worried about you and I had to ask, because that's what we do as Legionnaires in this family. That's what we do. So then you're gonna ask, have you actually had any thoughts? This is to dig a little bit deeper. You're going from wishing and, you know, wished you could go to sleep, wished you were dead, to thoughts of it. I'm having active ideation. You want to know where they're at with their thought pattern. So that is critically important. And again, if they say no, that's it. You don't have to go any further. So then the next question is, have you been thinking about how you might do it? Thank you, Wendy. She knows that I'm getting old and my eyes are bad. She sees me up here squinting. So have you been thinking about how you might do it? Now we're getting at intent. Have you thought of how? I spoke to a Legionnaire yesterday and she shared, I have thought of driving my car off a cliff. So at that point, if I asked her that question, have you been thinking about how? Her answer would be yes. Yes, and you see the color coded? There's some, some science behind the color coded, the red questions, the orange questions, and the yellow. I might bring back some memories for folks on their active duty days where we had the, the stoplight charts, green, yellow, red, and what was going well in the unit, and what wasn't. But this is symbolic because it's basically like, where are we getting to higher and higher risk? How you might do it, and then you're gonna ask the question, have you had these thoughts and had intent to act? So now we're adding together the thinking and the how with potential action. And you wanna ask that question. Well, yes, I've thought about driving off of a cliff and I've thought of the spot and I know where I'll do it because I've seen it happen before where someone has done this and they, I knew that it ended their life and I want to do the same. That's very clear answer about how you might do it. And, and have you had any thoughts on how, uh, and some intention of acting on them? Yes, I think I'll do it before the holiday season. I intend to do it this November. Early, you know, so they're really starting to put more details into their plan. And you want to ask them, have you started to work out or worked out these details to kill yourself? Do you have the intent to carry out this plan? And you will get there and it might get confusing. Well, they'll say, well, I've had thoughts and I'm thinking of my intention, but I don't think I could ever do it because my children need me, because I have um, requirements that I have to take care of for my wife before I could do that. Like, so you can see the ambivalence, the dance with the ambivalence, right? So you're, but you have to ask the questions because you won't know whether or not they're struggling at this depth of a level without asking the question. And I have, I tell the story, I, I shared I was the behavioral health lead for the Marine Corps, we had a Marine who shared there is a set, there's a train at Quantico. How many of you have been to Quantico? You know where the train is over in Q-Town? So there's a, a Marine that said he, he, he knew there was a train on every Tuesday at seven o'clock. He had the intent on ending his life by getting in front of this train on base. And he had sat in his car alone on Tuesdays at six to seven, he knew. So it was high, high risk versus somebody who says, I intend to use a firearm because I know it's the most lethal method, but I don't have one. Uh, I'm not sure how I would get one. I don't, I don't use one in my job, you know, I'm in the back office. I don't regularly have access to them. I don't have money to buy one. You can start to unpack their story a little more. And so then you go on to question six. Have you done anything, started to do anything, or prepared? We're looking for preparatory behavior. I purchased the gun two weeks ago. And we see that in the fatality reports, that they purchased a weapon in the days leading up to their death by suicide. I have been collecting my pills from the VA, and I've not been taking them because I know on this date I'm going to take them all. Like, this is preparatory behavior, right? So you want to know have, if they say yes, 
Have they done this within the past three months? We're looking for the recency factor. I do see in our completed suicide reports across the nation that people have made an attempt in their past and maybe an attempt at 15, an attempt at 25, an attempt now at 30. And so a, a prior attempt is a high risk situation, but if they're having this preparatory behavior in that three months, it is very high risk. So I want to make sure that you're comfortable with the questions. I encourage you, and we got to do this yesterday with the auxiliary group, to practice with each other, have conversations. You heard from Wendy that it, is, it does not plant the seed. If, if you ask your colleague here, are you thinking of, uh, you know, if, Asking a question about suicide will not give them the idea. So practice it with each other because it's not easy. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it's possible because saving lives is absolutely possible. Suicide is, is a preventable issue. It is not something that we just have to take in our nation. It is not like, a, a, it should not be part of our everyday life. So I want to turn it back over to Wendy. Let's see if I'm doing this for you. I'm pressing it. Oh. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So how to ask the question really matters. Like Kita said, she went through in that sequence, right? It's very, very important to make sure you do the same thing, that you use that sequence. And I'll tell you, it's scary. It's scary. So just to normalize it, it's not an easy task to do. Um, but we're going to give you a little bit. Let me see. It's not going here. We're going to give you a little bit, OK, of information on how to do this, right? So your mission, when you are caring for somebody else that you think may be suicidal, you wanna make sure that you're keeping that person safe and in front of you, right? Um, you want to do that and be, be present, and I can't say that enough. You'll see this on another slide too, be present. It's easy, very, very easy when you think the next person or the person that you're talking to may be suicidal, it's very, very easy for your mind to start going, right? Oh my gosh, if I ask them the questions, the Colombian, go through that, what are they gonna say? And then what am I gonna do? I've been there. I've done this many, many times. And it does get easier, but I still try to keep myself in the present, right? And listen to their story. And if you do that, you're gonna leave also a good impression. So that person will come back to you and they'll thank you. And they'll also come back to you if they need additional help. One big thing too that was on the previous slide I failed to mention is that when you listen to somebody's story, you need to take care of yourself. You really, really do. Because sometimes the story's complex. Yes. Sometimes it really hits home. Sometimes it's very, very sad all the time, right? So take time for yourself afterwards. It's good self-care. It's good self-care. Um, and we please, please do that. Whether it's calling a buddy, just taking the rest of the day off, taking a walk around the block, whatever works for you, that's very important to do. So again, I talked about staying in the moment and staying present, right? Listen to them. This is not a time to tell your story. And I say that just very nicely to everybody because that's an easy thing for us to do. If somebody's telling us something, it's easy for us to do, well, gosh, you know what? Let me tell you about a time. And then we start to tell about our story, right? Not that we're trying to one-up them at all, goodness, but we can relate to them. It's okay to tell them that you can relate. That's absolutely fine. Um, and that you know that you've been, that they know that you've been probably in that place too, right? So um, it's very, very important to make sure that you're there. Keep a positive attitude. We don't want to sit like this, stand like this, you know, or look off to the side. Or we all know when someone's not talking to us, when they start to get glassy eyed, right? We can all tell. So it's really, really important to make sure that we're there. Listen carefully, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But listen carefully and don't judge them. That's a big thing too. Um, really don't judge them. But it's important when you're listening to also let them know, okay, so I've heard that you've told me this, X, Y, and Z, right? You've told me that you've been thinking about suicide, you just got a divorce, your kids are super mad at you, you lost your job, you can prayer phrase it back to them. Um, and then you say, you know what, I, 
I really care for you, and I care about what happens to you. I'm going to ask you some questions. You don't ask permission to ask questions. That's very, very important. And if you can remember that, that's important. You don't ask permission. You say, I care for you, I'm worried for you, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And you can pull out the card. That is absolutely fine to pull out the card. We still do it. I have the app on my phone. I'll tell you how to get it on yours. I have the app on my phone and I go through the questions. It's probably easier on the app because it's sequential too. It just pops right up. Super easy. Um, and it's okay to pull it up. And then if they do say that they, if, you do, if they are um, at risk, even if they're not at risk, but they're struggling, you're not gonna just say, okay, great, you know, and then move on, right? You're still gonna try to get them help, whatever that is. Hey, can I call a friend for you? Do you have somebody that you feel safe with? Can I just sit here and talk with you? You wanna go grab coffee um, and chat, whatever it is that makes them feel more comfortable. If they're high risk, you wanna get them immediate attention. Kita had talked about 988. 988 is our national um, mental health and suicide prevention uh, call, call line. It's like 911, but it's 988. Who's heard of that? Okay. And there's still some people in the audience that haven't. The other day when we were training the um, auxiliary, wonderful group of women, I will say, and men that were there, um, but a lot of them hadn't heard of it. And I don't know if that was because the majority were rural. I, I'm not sure. But it's very, very important to make sure that we all know that number as well. Because if you do have somebody who is an immediate risk and needs help, you're going to three-way call them. You're not going to give the number or tell the person, here, call 988. Go home and call 988. You want to get them help immediately. Unfortunately, we do know that taking a veteran specifically to an emergency room heightens the risk. They get a little anxious. But I'm not gonna say that's not a good thing too, okay? If, that's, if the individual is not comfortable with you calling 988, calling their friend, calling their best buddy, calling their, their chaplain, would, whoever it is or whatever it is to get help, immediate help, um, that's great. Including the police, including the, taking them to the emergency room, whatever it is, calling the ambulance, whatever it is, right? You just need to get that individual help. Kita, do you want to add to that? No, I think this is Okay. So this is the card. This is the tool. This, you'll hear this being called two different names. So the first one, the scientific one, is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Obviously pretty long, a reason why we don't call it that. Um, we call it the Columbia Protocol. So you'll hear it called two different ways. And this is how you can download it. I'm encouraging you, and I'm gonna give you time right now, to pick up your card. On the back of your card, right below your questions, is this QR code. If you have a smartphone, it will not work on a flip phone. If you have a smartphone, open up your camera, hover over either the Android or the iPhone, the Apple, and a link will come up. I think, it's kind of, I think it's orangey, but a link comes up. Click on that link, and it'll download. I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to do that. And I'm going to go back later on and ask about the data and see how many of you did it. <laughs> and I'll report back. So. <laughs> but it's important to have that. And it's OK to pull out your phone and use it. I can have discussion today. Okay. If you have any questions, we've been out to many of your states already, um, but if you want to have suicide prevention specifically in your location, let us know. Email Dr. Kelly Posner. That's her email. That's her direct phone number as well. I always tell her, oh my gosh, Kelly, what are you doing? You're giving out your phone number to thousands of people, but that's okay because we're all about saving a life. Again, on behalf of the Lighthouse Project, Keita and I, thank you so much. Super excited to be part of this, be the one um, 
uh, platform as we move forward to save lives, specifically, specifically in our veteran population. And remember, it's all about the solution, getting into your community and using the protocol. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you to the commander. Yes.